This is episode 64. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enoch Bartlett Sears, AIA, and today we have an awesome presentation. I know everyone's going to get lots of lots of good information. You're going to want to lock your door, take out your notepad, and put this one on replay because I'm sure you're not going to be able to keep up with all the great information in this particular interview. Herbert M. Cannon is one of the nation's leading experts in the management of AE firms. And today we're going to discuss how to turn your firm into an unstoppable force of nature. And Mr. Cannon himself is an unstoppable force of nature. So, Herbert, welcome to the show. Well, Enoch, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. It's really, uh, it's an honor. You know, my, me and my firm, were dedicated to helping architecture engineering firms earn the profits that they deserve for all of their creative efforts. Um, you know, ever since I became involved with engineering and architecture firms, I find that, you know, they really create an extraordinary value and often that value is not rewarded financially. You know, most of them are very professionally rewarded. However, they're falling a little bit short on the financial side, and that's what I try to help them out with. That is a perfect message for what this show is about. And I'm, like I said, I'm excited to have you on here. I hope you don't mind the introduction, a little power pack, but I know you're a guy with a sense of humor based upon our conversations through email. Yeah. So I thought you would, uh, you would enjoy that. And I just want to mention to our audience also that um, Herb has actually worked with a number of illustrious firms in here in the U.S., so he's not just someone who has kind of come up with these solutions on his own. He's done this through practical experience over years, gives seminars all around the country. So we really look forward to finding out uh, your, your opinions and your thoughts on the state of architecture. Well, the business of architecture anyway. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> Now, Herb, in, in our email exchange, you did say that you have a plenty of, of opinions that you're more than willing to share. I, I, do, I do have a lot of opinions, and to get my opinion real, all you have to do is ask, and I, I will give you the opinion. It may be not the uh, perhaps the most politically correct opinion, but, you know, it's not my job to make people feel good about what they're already doing. You know, most of the firms that I work with, I mean, they're already successful. You know, they, they have 8, 10, 20, 50, 100, 300 employees. And, you know, many of the, the, the founders, they've created it from nothing. So they're already, already, already successful. And I just want to help them really reap, reap those financial rewards. And you have worked with some of the nation's most illustrious firms. And I'm just curious, you know, in terms of the state of architecture now, how have you seen things sort of change over the past 10 to 15 years? Well, you know, even, even over more than the last 10 to 15 years. I remember when I started with uh, Erwin Krantz, Exta, and Kuhn Architects back in 1995. And at the time, you know, there was still a lot of hand drafting going on. You know, people were, were designing by hand, drawing by hand. There's still a lot of drawing by hand and concepts and so forth. But really, the technology had not really taken over over the profession. And I remember they had the three, um, 386, you know. Yeah, um, the, the Pentium, computer, yeah, the 386 yeah, computers. Yeah, 386 computers, uh, monochrome monitors doing AutoCAD, what, whatever version, wondering if they should make a commitment to do it and doing it all electronically. <laughs> uh, you know, of course, I nudged them really to, to start doing it all electronically. So that's where we came from there. So, you know, the, the technology has really become a much more integral part of the design process, not only the AutoCAD, but SketchUp and all these other things that are in there. And what I think what the architecture engineering profession has failed to do that a lot of other professions have done is leverage that for their own financial benefit. I think if we look at the quality of drawings and the quality of service that we're giving now in the year 2014 compared to, to 1995, it's just light, year, light years ahead. Now, and the main beneficiary of that has been, has been the architect's clients. If I compare that to CPA firms, for example, they have pushed all of the, the drudgery, all of the hard work back to the client, and they just take this, that, that product, polish it up a little bit, but they don't charge them any less. So they're actually doing less work and charging more. I think us in the design profession, business, uh, we're doing more and not charging enough. What are your thoughts and recommendations about how to swap that around? Well, you know, somebody's always going to always going to do it cheaper. 
And, you know, part of the challenge that we have, I think, uh, you know, people like myself and, and you, is that, you know, we deal with engineers, we deal with architects, most of them have postgraduate degrees, some of the smartest people that I've ever met, you know, and that's really why I, I enjoy working the, with them, is they're, they're, they're so smart, um, they have this little voice in their head that they know the other side of the argument, they, they're, they're afraid, they, they, they live in the depression mentality, perhaps, if you will, you know, those of us who have been in the business for 25, 30 years, we've seen at least three or four major downturns. And I think when those downturns happen, it kind of pushes us, pushes us back to that depression mentality. And it takes us a long time to, to come out of that. Certainly when times are bad, certainly at the, in the end of 2008, 2009, you know, we we're kind of forced to take almost any job at any price. Um, and it takes a long time to turn to turn that around, even when the economy is getting better, which it has been over the last you know eighteen months or so. Yeah, uh, tell me a little bit more about what you mean by the depression mentality. Well, it, it, it means that you're afraid where the next job is going to come from. Um, you're afraid of how are you going to pay your rent that you've committed to on that five year lease or in the leasehold improvement loan that you've taken out, or how are you going to pay your employees, you know, cover payroll, cover payroll taxes. Let's face it, you know, a lot of us were in a survival mode five, six years ago. And, you know, I think the average firm that, that, that I knew and I was aware of, we, um, we saw, our, you know, our clients here at AEC Management reduce their workforce by about 30%. Um, you know, even firms that were profitable, you know, downsize just because the lack of volume of work and uh, was, you know, something they had to do. And I, I think that, you know, one thing that I've noticed over the years on the business side is the downsizing and the adjustments on the overhead that were made at the end of 2008, 2009 were done much more quickly, much more severely than they had done previously. There wasn't a lot of wishful thinking going on mm. um, that we all get, you know, all the big jobs coming in next week, next month, yeah. whatever. I can't, how, how am I ever going to get the work done if I lay off people, if I give up this office space? We weren't caught up in that so much in, in, in the end of 2008, 2009. So the adjustments were, were swift and severe and, and probably necessary. Yeah, it definitely affected the profession pretty profoundly. And so we have technology was a change you've seen. Do you see any, any big waves or, or overall factors that are influencing the way we're going to practice for the next 10 years or so on the horizon here? Any big changes in the industry? You know, they, 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 they always talk about change. They talk about, you know, design build is the new thing. Um, there's always the man management fed du jour. Um, and I, I don't th see things changing all that much, quite frankly. I think it's going to be more of the same. I think people are still slow to take on the additional fixed committed expenses on the business side. And that's probably a good thing. But from the from the practice side, you know, I, I, I see consolidation now. I see larger firms gobbling up smaller firms. Um, I see the people that were laid off in 2008 starting their own firms, restarting the cycle. So it's almost like a continuous cycle where times are bad, lay people off. Yep. Some firms get absorbed by others. The people that were laid off, you know, a good portion of them for sure get out of the industry. Yep. But the other, other people, they start their own business. Yep. You know, that, that's, I mean, this is how, quite frankly why I'm a management consultant because, you know, I had a, a, dis, a, a disagreement with one of the, my illustrious employers that you referred to back in, in 95. And I said, you know, perhaps, you know, consulting is best for me. And it's been very good for me personally. So, you know, I'm, I'm an, a living example of how people, when, you, when, you, when your job terminates and perhaps you think that life is over, it's really perhaps a new opportunity. And it's the fact that I parted ways with that company is personally one of the best things that's ever happened to me. That's very inspiring, and we could almost end right there. That's a great life lesson. <laughs> well, you, you could cut this up and put that at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Herb, what kind of you, – you do seminars across, the, across the, the nation right now, and what are some of the most uh, popular topics that people are requesting and, and talking about in response to your seminars? 
Yeah, it, you know, it's funny. The things tend to go in, t- things tend to go in cycles as to what people are interested in. Correct. Um, in some some points, right now, I'm I'm getting I am getting a lot of interest in the ownership transition valuation of your AE firm seminars that I'm doing, and you know, and I, I you know I have these seminars. I have more I have more coming up, and you know, it's people my age, a little bit younger, a little bit older that have been through. Maybe, two or three of these tough times that I'm talking about and they've kind of managed to come through the last one. They don't really want to go through it again, you know, uh, and jeopardize and jeopardize everything. You kind of get a little bit tired of tired of that fight. So there's a great interest now in how am I going to extract the value that I've created in this firm, either through transitioning internally, selling to the outside, um, what is the process for doing that? Who are the advisors that I need? You know, I heard from so and so at a party that your firm is valued this way. Um, you know, you get a lot of the cocktail party management philosophy that comes back that I try to undo and, and paint the real world. So right now, there's 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 interest there's interest in that. At one point, in, and I'm starting to see this pick up right now, is also incentive compensation, where um, we we help we we reward people on the financial results that they're producing rather than at the end of the year you know the two or three owners sit in a room and they divvy up uh, on some arbitrary subjective method of how we're going to pay year end bonuses you know a bonus plan is not the same as a incentive compensation plan inherently they're they're, they're very they're very different so I've done a lot of work with um, incentive compensation. I hear the same objections to incentive compensation, but I have never seen incentive compensation not work effectively if you're already a well-run firm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, part of part of the issues that I get into, and it's actually how I developed a good relationship with Ax- Axiom Software, was that you know, Herbie, yeah, we'd like to put in an incentive compensation plan. Great. Let me come in. I talk. Let me see your financial systems. How are you tracking project profits? How are you tracking it by project manager, by branch office, by discipline? However, you divide it up. And I would go in, and you know, they're not using an, a, a, the appropriate software to do that. If they do have the appropriate software, they're not using it. They're not tracking it. And so the first thing, and then almost becomes a remedial assignment to help them get their financial systems and reporting up to speed because one thing is for sure and particularly with and I've heard this with 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 many with many architects years years ago is you know Herb, I, you know, I, I really don't care about the money you know I'm not I'm not in this for the money and you know okay Un- understood but what they're really saying is I don't care about your money okay they don't care about your money for your company. I care about my che- paycheck, and if I have the opportunity to make more, I will make more. Or I don't understand the numbers. Herb, I don't understand the numbers. I don't believe in the numbers. And all of a sudden, when it becomes their money, when they have the opportunity to earn a significant incentive, these people are become financial geniuses. They know that they know the numbers. Upside and upside, <laughs> they have new ways of analyzing profits that I never thought of. So, it, you know, all of a sudden you have, if you have a 40-person firm, you have 40 financial experts, which is a good thing. So the first thing that they're going to do in an incentive plan is they are going to challenge the numbers. So you better be on top of your numbers. So, you know, anyway, I, got, I went on a little bit off track on that, but incentive compensation was a big thing. And I, th- I see now as firms are starting to grow again, there's hiring going on, there's rebuilding going on. We do not necessarily want to go back to the same business model that we had before in 2007. Even though times were great, we're making money. When times are great, it hides a lot of problems. Okay. And so when you say the business model we had before, how would you characterize that? Well, the biggest business model we had before, you know, as I recall, you know, 2005, 6, 7, we were, you couldn't hire enough people to get the work. Everybody was working at 120% capacity. If you had 50 people, you needed 60. If you had 200 people, you needed 240. That's just the way it was. So, you know, we're, everyone was making a lot of money. Everyone was making a lot of money. Um, 
help the other firms that were that were very smart and well managed um, made even more money, and they didn't spend it all. You know, they squirreled it away for, away for the rainy day. You know, my philosophy is that every firm, barring some sort of government contractual reg regulation, should be making a minimum of a 20% profit on their net revenues. I mean, many of my clients back then and have now have actually returned to this, were actually making a f over a 40% profit on net revenues. Didn't happen mm -hmm. overnight. But as a way of just fine tuning and you know up, upping your billing rates, becoming more selective about your clients, and you know getting paid really for all of the work that you do, that that scope creep. Yep. That, heard, that'll help you do it. I, I had an interesting conversation on Twitter with someone, a couple architects that I respect very highly, and we were talking about this particular this particular question, and I had put out the tweet that that an architecture. A bare minimum should be expecting a 20% uh, profit margin that was reasonable to expect. And mm -hmm. one architect wrote me back with a very interesting comment that I think sort of typifies some psychological thinking about money and about profits. I want to get your feedback. But what he said, he said, <clears throat> simple comment, I think was something along the lines of, that sounds greedy to me. Um, yeah, you know, I, that's okay. You know, that's okay. And I really understand where, 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 where they're coming from. And uh, you know, we can talk about the psychology behind that, um, but you know what? What what I say to them is, you know, who is better off with this money? Are we better off leaving that money with the developer client, with the government, whatever, whatever your client type is? Is the money better spent there, or is it better spent in your hands, where you can where you can reward that your employees? perhaps make a larger contribution to their 401k, provide better for their families, give raises, have nice events. Or if you don't want to do that, maybe there's some sort of local charity that you would like to do. I mean, it was a firm that I worked with in Vermont that kind of had the same thing. They had like a ceiling on what they felt was a reasonable profit. So I said, well, you know, why don't we do this? Why don't we find an organization that we believe in here and that we could help locally and you know we'll help them we'll get some publicity from it too everybody, everybody will win so they found a, a, a battered woman shelter that needed some sort of rehab or expansion and they actually donated money to that plus their services and what they felt as though was the excess profit on this one particular project so i think that's a way that that i try to come back to people you know and, and when, when i talk about making money it's not about being greedy, being greedy. It's not about you know these Wall Street movies or anything like that for people who don't create any value. You know the, the architects and engineers are creating an extraordinary value. They deserve to be rewarded for it. They the, the money should go to them, their employees, and it should be shared with shared with those charitable organizations. I think that's a much better use than. Uh, and them not having it. So I don't. I don't know what those those other people do with do with that money. They buy they buy football teams. Yeah, well, I, I definitely agree as well. Just my personal feeling that um, an equal exchange of value. The more you can equalize that between the two parties, whether it's the owner and the architect, it seems like that's a great way just to maximize the value all around. Yes. So in, incentive compensation. You know, what would it look like in as from an employee's perspective to be in a firm? that is employing a good incentive compensation plan. I'd like to sort of get in the details of how that works. Of how an incentive, I'm getting an emergency alert here on my cell phone that we're going to have a, uh, take it. that we're going to have a flood. So I will, uh, I will turn this off so it doesn't bother us anymore. <laughs> so I'm, I'm you're, okay, wait, wait a second. So <laughs> there's going to be a flood and you're, you're going to carry on through the flood. I'm going to carry on through the flood just like Noah did. Herb, you're um, dedicated. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I, I apologize for that. Where, where, where are we? No problem. We were just, I just asked the question about, I'd like to talk about incentive compensation. Try to get yeah. an idea of, you know, what does that really look like? Um, so we talked about the high level. You know, how does that, how does that implement it in a firm? Yeah, okay. Well, incentive compensation, you know, is a, 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 probably best explained through an example. You know, I worked with one firm where they had six partners who were, managing projects. There was two other pro one was a managing partner, one was the I don't know, the the marketing partner, and the other six managed managed projects, sold projects. And we have one partner who was making over a million dollars a year in profit. 
consistently thereabouts. Mm -hmm. Another partner who was losing six hundred thousand dollars a year consistently. Now the ones making two hundred and the ones losing one fifty. At the end of the year, they're making a very small profit, maybe two to four percent profit on their net revenues. Now that presents a real challenge, you know, because number one, they're all getting the same salary. They all have the same resources. They have, you know, same employee pool, the same human resources, the same IT, the same design tools, the same name on the door that should bring people in. So how do we motivate people to be, you know, the person who's losing money to make money and to encourage the person who's making the profit not to leave the firm? You know, if I'm the person making a lot of money and I'm looking around and my partner is getting all the same benefits and he's, you know, he's drilling holes in the back of the boat while I'm rowing as fast as I can. <laughs> I might want to throw him off the boat or I, I might jump off the boat, one or the other. Yeah. So what we, what we try to do is give everyone has market salaries or better. Okay, we're not punishing anyone, but what we're going to do, you know, you know, to the extent that you contribute more profit to the firm, you're going to get a larger share of that. Okay, so it only makes so it only makes sense. So we we try to start at the partner level or the highest up level to make sure that those people are highly motivated because they're the ones that have the most influence. The level be below that, you know, project managers. We can have a project management incentive. Where we, you know, divide the company's profits into certain pools: mm -hmm. one for the partners, one for the project managers, one for non-titled employees. And we get that, and, and everyone gets to participate. So we talk about non-titled employees, including the administrative staff. We create a pool for those employees of money, and it gets divided based on the relative percentage of their salaries as it relates to the total salaries within that pool. Follow? Yep. Okay. So that's how we, we reward them because it's hard to really directly relate their efforts to the results, to the financial results, and they don't have that much control over it. The higher up you go, the more that we want to tie you to the financial results. And remember, we're never punishing anyone, right? No one ever gets, you're still getting your salary, you're still getting your benefits. Mm. But you know what? You know, if I made a lot of money, Maybe I'll get a ten thousand dollar distribution. You didn't make any. Maybe you'll get two thousand. Okay, so it's a little bit more than that. When you talk about a bonus system that's highly subjective, the overachievers financially tend to be under rewarded. The underachievers tend to be over rewarded. So we kind of try to we compress that down in, into the middle. And to me, that's unfair. Mm -hmm. What kind of systems are used to track performance and? determine, you know, for instance, partners, you know, how much revenue are they responsible for? Um, well, you know, talk about the, you know, the, the, the two softwares that are, that are used is, you know, the Axiom Majera software tracks everything by project and project manager and the other one, Dell Tech Vision. Mm -hmm. uh, Dell Tech just bought Axiom. So it's really, those are the, uh, the, the two softwares that, you know, that I'm familiar with and that I, I support you know, and, and have great familiarity with and it. It's easy enough to set up. It's easy enough to track. Yeah. It's easy enough. It's easy enough to track, and that's not the hard. Thing. The hardest thing that I've seen is convincing the people at the top that it's going to work and promote the right behavior. You know, what we never want to do is we never want to compromise design. We find out you're compromising design. You're going to do it over once, twice, three times, ten times because we're still going to give that level. But what it does, and, and, and I haven't seen that. I haven't, I haven't seen that happen. I've seen people be more focused in getting to the solution and not spending a lot of time wandering off doing designs that really are unrealistic or they know will, will never happen. So it gets us much more focused and uh, spend more time in producing that, that quality product. So um, generally it's, it's, and with the incentive compensation, if you say, let's say I'm the 100% owner of a company, why would I want to share my profits with any of the employees on an incentive basis? You know, and I think, that, I think that's a fair question. Why would I? Well, I would have to be convinced that by sharing one-third of my profits with my 
key people, my entire company, that in the end, the two thirds that I have left as a dollar value will be greater than the hundred percent that I used to keep. If you if you follow that logic, so yep. if I was making a hundred thousand dollars now, and I'm going to put thirty thousand dollars into a, a profit pool, I need to be convinced that in a short amount of time, I'm still going to be making more than a hundred thousand dollars. Right? It's not about dividing the pie up into smaller pieces. It's about growing the pie. Okay, um, and we see that you know people that are that are motivated by money, and most people are motivated by money, even if they say they're not, um, all of a sudden they become much better um, managers on the business side. All of a sudden, you know, yeah, it's a, you know, it's a, it was a $450,000 contract, and yeah, there's an extra here that'll probably uh, be another five or $10,000. Yeah, I don't want to just let it go. And that's easy to say in the context of a company. However, if you know that by getting that $10,000 change of scope that's completely legitimate and we should be paid for as design professionals. If I know I'm going to put $2,500 in my pocket out of that, I am much more motivated to get that. So what we find is, is that we, all of the key indicators of the company escalate because we're really getting paid for a lot of that out of scope uh, work. And that really, that really is the key. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.